talk a little bit about the struggles to get to that first dollar and then what it felt like after that first dollar dude the biggest thing for me was mindset and i know everyone like throws on the word mindset and they're like woo woo <laughs> kind of stuff but it's like it's so real the deeper i get into business the more i realize it's like mindset is the most important part of business Everything else can be kind of learned. Everything else can kind of be like taught or experienced. Now, obviously there's some information that's harder to acquire than other information, but like, you will be successful. You can get to like a multi-million dollar status without having all the information if you have the right mindset and you're just like every day you show up and you're just like hammering every single like day, either outreach or with content or with like paid traffic. It's like pick, like I think Alex Mormozzi said this and he's like, either you do a hundred pieces of outreach per day a hundred pieces of content per day or a hundred dollars on ad spend per day. You just pick one and you hammer that and you show up every single day. Like there's no way you don't just get filthy rich by the end of like a year. And so like when you haven't made that first dollar, I think the biggest thing that gets in the way of people is they don't know it's possible. Welcome back to the Virtual Ventures Podcast. I'm your host, Andres Sanchez. Today, we have Roheth on the show. Roheth is a brand strategist who has worked with tons of people and CEOs to really help them create brands via social media, personal brands, and things like that. Roheth, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Of course, man. Glad to be here. And for anybody who's tuning in right now, make sure to like, subscribe, follow, show us that love, help us continue to grow, and be able to interview more amazing people like Roheth. I like to get it rolling right off the bat. I want everybody to be able to know a little bit more about you. Tell us who Roheth is and a little bit about your background. So kind of grew up in more of like a traditional kind of Indian household, like academics was like always like pretty important kind of thing. Progressed onwards, did the whole college kind of thing. Wish I had a cool like college dropout story, <laughs> but I don't. <laughs> I finished that and decided to kind of go into data science. And so that's what I did when I was like first working like the nine to five kind of thing and still kind of am working that starting this whole like brand strategy thing on the side but around early september this year i decided like hey like i kind of kind of want to take the leap into entrepreneurship and really dive into that kind of platform but for the longest time i was camera shy like that was actually something <laughs> that did hold me back for a period of time and so I looked at all the platforms and I was looking at YouTube, Instagram, like Google, Facebook, Twitter, and every single platform, it seems to deprioritize people who are anonymous, except for some mm -hmm. reason, Twitter specifically, it prioritizes people who are anonymous with yep. those platitude accounts and stuff because they write more generic content and people just like them more. And so I decided, hey, let me start off as one of those accounts. Let me have like a platitude account. And so this past September, I launched that account and decided to start growing it around like a month in and actually i should probably preface this with so i went on this guide and it was like a guide written by this guy named life math money which is like a big twitter like platitude account and kind of had like a guide breaking a lot of stuff down and so i kind of said you know what i'm gonna follow exactly like what he says and start off there and so for like a month or so i kind of started applying like the stuff he had and it was decent advice but it was also uh it was more geared for people who were kind of more platitude accounts and not necessarily personal brands. And so my growth was a little bit slower. Now that guide has worked well for a lot of other people, but for me in particular, the branding was just not jiving super well with the strategy. And so I decided to join this guy's cohort. He goes by Art of Purpose on Twitter. And oh, yeah. I met a lot of cool people. I learned a lot about like the Twitter world, like in that sense. And I had a lot more of like an understanding on like what kind of was going on with Twitter. And I gained something like 30, 40 followers, like once I was in that cohort, which was, was super impressed with at the time. Like I had prior to the cohort, I gained maybe like 20 followers. So like adding another 30, that was over double what I'd originally come into it. So I was pretty yeah. happy, but I also kind of sat down and really thought to myself like, Hey, you know, um, if I'm ever going to monetize this, I have to take like a leap of faith and I have to really be willing to commit to something like a little bit more serious. And so that cohort ended around the end of December and early January, I kind of decided, you know what, let me actually like take this more seriously and invest. And so I like went really, really 
seriously into it. And I also decided, hey, if I'm going to invest a lot of money, I like I better invest it doing like building my personal brand, not building up some like platitude account. Yeah. So early January, I made the decision. And essentially over the next like month or so, I invested 40K into various like masterminds programs and mentorships and growth like retweets and stuff like that just so that I could put myself in the best possible situation to become really really good in this space and commit yep. to this space and then I just started launching and once I started I was writing like essentially I was writing a thread a day and four tweets on top of that I was sending out a hundred DMs a day and I was commenting on like 200 accounts a day prior to the wow. show ban, and then dialed that down to like 150 yeah and I was in like six different mastermind groups constantly networking with people and just really trying to get exposure into the world of Twitter and how I could get the most possible results and you invest all that money you're kind of all in like you you don't really have a yeah. chance of saying like hey no, you're all in really feeling this anymore like it was one of those situations where it was like i was going to make this work and so that's kind of what i decided to do and now i've kind of gotten to a point where things are starting to kind of pay off i've kind of been on like the other end of the like kind of the side of things and now i'm kind of a lot more comfortable like i'm less like nervous about whether or not i'm ever going to pay off like 40k like, now i know it's like it's very very doable it's a lot of people like are so hesitant on whether or not it's possible to make that first dollar but i can definitely say once you make that first dollar online the rest is just a lot easier and it's a lot smoother and i think anyone who really like sets their mind to it can do it yeah that's awesome and i can relate to you on a few of those things like I had businesses prior to this podcast, but I refused to put a personal brand behind them. It was always my Discord personality or my Twitter personality that had an NFT as a profile picture and no name, just my Discord name because that's where my businesses primarily ran off. And then I took the leap of faith into this and got so much more comfortable having my face out there. And it helped my networking so much. It helped my ability to go in and, and speak a lot better and come off with more confidence. So that was great. And then you gave us a ton of stuff to unpack right off the bat, which thank you for that. For anybody watching, there's never any set questions when we do this. So that was amazing. And I'd like to just start kind of at the beginning, like what were the beginning days of starting at Twitter? Like when you made that Platitude account and at what point, what was really like the catalyst to flipping the switch to like, all right, I'm going all in on this and this is my strategy. Yeah course so when i first made the platitude account i wasn't 100 percent committed like i thought hey it would be cool if i made money on twitter but it wasn't <laughs> like i wasn't like i have to make money on twitter and i think that's a very important mindset shift for people to have when they're trying to win a game that is very competitive there are a lot of people yep. on twitter here selling like services and the people that are going to win aren't the people that are like it would be nice if i got a sale they're the people that are like i want this sale i'm gonna go after the sale i'm gonna give a hundred 10% to every single customer I work with. Those are the people that are going to win. And so I was kind of halfway in. And one of the areas that I was really stuck on was finding like my niche. Like I spent a lot of time really wrestling with like different skills and going down and figuring out like, hey, where do I want to start? Like, what do I want to do? And like to anyone out there who's in like a the similar situation, like it's really just picking something and going with it and knowing that you can change it later on if you want hmm. to. Like it's, you're not like locked in. Like I don't, looking back at it, I like there's so many people who live in this like delusion where they're like, hey, if I pick something, I have to stick with that no matter what. And if I change it, like everyone in my audience is not going to like me anymore and they're going to like unfollow me i'm like no like if you build your brand the right way and you're being authentic about like the things you're experimenting with and you are communicating with your audience and actually care about connecting with people then when you change your niche people are going to be like that's natural it's honestly slightly atypical for someone to be doing the same thing for like 20 30 years straight like people jump around people try different things that that's kind of the beauty of life and so yeah. i think the biggest thing is like the biggest kind of turning point for me was when I kind of picked a niche and decided to kind of really like hammer on that niche and tell myself, you know what? I'm going to try to become as successful as possible at the niche that I choose and figure it out from there. And now it's like I've been able to expand with the services that I've offered. I offer clients like multiple services now. I'm able to expand and I'm able to really dive into a wider array of customer problems and figure out how I can best help customers solve those problems. But it all started by me picking one problem and getting people to trust me on my ability to solve that problem for other people. 
And so that's really like kind of like the start of my journey. So initially I was just kind of, I was tweeting a lot about like very generic stuff because when you don't pick a niche, you tweet about yeah. everything. And I was tweeting yep. a lot of general business advice and I was hoping people would like come to me for, I don't even know, maybe like business coaching or something, which is the dumbest thing looking back at it, because if you don't have business experience, you really have no, no business being a business coach. Like you're better off starting out and picking like a skill, getting really good at like that, like either technical or like that, like social skill, and then maybe building off of that and slowly from there becoming like a business person. But like first, like you gotta, you gotta understand marketing. You gotta understand sales. You gotta understand product. You gotta understand growth. Like there are so many parts of business you have to understand before you are qualified to teach business. So if, like yep. those people who are like positioning themselves as like, Hey, I'm a millionaire, even though they, they're not actually a millionaire, it's like <laughs> they're just screwing themselves and they don't understand why they're doing that. Yeah. I love that point there at the end. I think there's a lot of phonies on social media. And I had an episode, I think like two episodes back with Clint Murphy, who's one of the people who's created a big following on Twitter. And him and I spoke about how I think viewers, followers, subscribers, whatever you want to call them are going to demand more transparency and authenticity going forward as more and more people enter these spaces and start to take social media super serious. Because I think it's crazy to think that we've had social media for so long, but I think people People aren't really widely adopting how seriously you could like make money on it until like now like I think I've seen more and more people kind of dive in and take that leap of faith I think people are going to demand more authenticity and more transparency um, behind the account so I love how because I think everybody has a little bit of that in them like even when I started my Twitter I was like oh like I founded a few businesses like I've been successful if I just tweet like cool shit about what I did and how I did it people are definitely gonna just flood into my DMs and ask like for help no, yeah. they don't. I could tell you that firsthand. And it's it's also hard, like for people listening, it's, it's really hard to narrow down what niche you want to do. And like, f at least for me to just focus on one thing, like my mind works in a million different ways. I want to, that's like a long winded answer, but I want to ask you like for people listening, because a lot of the people that listen are trying to build brands, starting to build brands and are trying to like navigate that part. And you said something really good early on, which was people don't think you can make that first dollar online. But once you do, it actually starts happening. Talk a little bit about the struggles to get to that first dollar and then what it felt like after that first dollar. Oh, yeah, dude. Like the biggest thing for me was mindset. And I know everyone like throws on the word mindset and they're like, woo woo <laughs> kind of stuff. But it's like, it's so real. And the, the deeper I get into business, the more I realize it's like mindset is the most important part of business. Everything else can be kind of learned. Everything else can kind of be like taught or experienced. Now, obviously there's some information that's harder to acquire than other information, but like, you will be successful. You can get to like a multi-million dollar status without having all the information if you have the right mindset and you're just like every day you show up and you're just like hammering every single like day, like either outreach or with content or with like paid traffic. It's like pick, like I think Alex Mormozzi said this and he's like, either you do a hundred pieces of outreach per day a hundred pieces of content per day or a hundred dollars on ad spend per day you just pick one and you hammer that and you show up every single day like there's no way you don't just get filthy rich by the end of like a year and so like when you haven't made that first dollar I think the biggest thing that gets in the way of people is they don't know it's possible because yep. they show up and like the only way they can pull off like that first sale is by absolutely like shafting themselves and like over fulfilling, like doing like taking on some like insane package and being like, hey, I'll like, I'll rewrite your landing page. I'll like buy the domain. I'll set up all the logistics. I'll network with all of like the vendors for like 200 bucks. And they're like, oh, I made the sale, but I have to do so much work. I might as well work a job. <laughs> and now that's, that's a whole nother conversation of like people just not <laughs> valuing themselves enough. But like when it comes to like making the first dollar, you just have to be consistent until it happens. And then once it happens, happens, you realize, hey, I did it once, I can do it again. And sometimes if like, if you talk to like, and a mentor of mine actually told him this, but it's like, if you talk to like 250 people, and none of them want your like product or your offer, and it's like, and you actually made an effort, you didn't just like spam DM a bunch of people like the same stuff, like you like followed them, maybe you interacted with some of their stuff. And like, you actually genuinely care about solving their problems. And you interact with 250 people, and they're all 
all not interested in your offer, chances are what, there are one of two problems. One is your offer is just really bad, in which case <laughs> you change your offer. Or two, people don't believe that you are an authority enough to execute on the offer that you are promising. That typically, that's number two, that typically happens when your offer is not like very clear. Mm -hmm. A lot of the offers that are absolutely like killing it on Twitter right now are the ones where there is a very clear before and there's a very clear after and you are positioning yourself as a person that can take the person from the before to the after. If that's not really clear, then people are just kind of confused. Like if your offer is I will help you like feel healthier, like can't I just do that with a Google search? Or if your offer is like huh. I will help you like get more leads, like how many more leads? Like, are you gonna take like six months to get me like five leads? Like that's terrible, that's really bad. Or is there like a quantifiable result over a quantifiable time frame? I think that's like a very important thing for people's like offers to resonate. So if you talk to 250 people and they all aren't interested in your offer at the price point you say, or like, or they just don't believe in you, then you have to step back at that point and figure out how can you address the bigger problem of either increasing your authority, improving your offer, maybe changing your price, or just getting people to believe that you're a trustworthy person? These are all things that are very important if you want to see like massive victory in this kind of space. But I'll tell you the biggest thing with collecting that first dollar is like once you collect it, it's it like shatters this like wall where it's like yep. you didn't think I it's possible, and then you collect the first dollar, and you're like someone out there trusts me to deliver some result for them and they are giving me money and then you can just essentially keep raising the price until just people stop paying you and you're like okay that's what the market values me right now and that's what i have to either increase my skill set improve my like authority or authenticity or whatever it takes to get to that next level and raise my prices to the next level and that could mean adding just more value to the offer or that could mean getting people to just believe you are more a more valuable person and that popping on like a 30 minute or a one hour call with you is a valuable use of their time yeah, and I'm curious for your opinion on this. What do you think about people who are starting out new? Because there's two sides to this. One, what do you think about people that are starting out new working for free to create case studies and, and really build themselves up and bet on themselves almost. And then on the other spectrum, I know you kind of touched on it and it was something I touched on in my last episode. What do you think about people just charging too little and that being a detriment to what they have or what their offer really showcases? That's two sides of the spectrum here. Yeah. So I think like success is a product of lots of time or lots of money or both. Like you have to invest something. You have to be willing to give something up, especially when yep. you're starting out. And so I'll first touch on like the case study one. I don't think that's a terrible idea. I think that's actually, that could be a great idea, especially if you have no like track record. What I would do, because that can be kind of a grueling process is I would like look in like my existing network. Like, I would look for like friends and stuff like that. And I'd be like, hey, I can do this for like a case study or something. Because if you do it online, people might hold you more accountable. They might really drill you on even and when it's for a testimonial it can be very demoralizing and so instead mm -hmm. if you go to like a friend and you're like hey i'll do like an abridged version of this for a case study you can now collect more case studies and you know as well as i know it's like your level of success literally scales with the quantity of case studies you have and so if you do like abridged versions of like the normal work that you would do for case studies then that has like a phenomenal result. You then get the traction you want. If your goal is to land clients really, really fast, then you should definitely do the case study thing. You should like go to people and be like, hey, like I'll do this for a case study and like get like three case studies. And then every time you pitch a client, it's like include the case study in your pitch. And like, you'll just close like so much more people compared to the people that are like, hey, uh, I'm new, so I'll work for you for like a discounted rate. And like, yada, yada. when I see those messages in my inbox, I almost always like just automatically like DQ the person. It's not because I don't like the person. It's not because they're like, like their approach is bad. It's because when someone charges me like a lower price, and this is kind of touches on that second question, yeah, I automatically assume that the quality is going to be lower. And so yeah. that means I'm going to have to revise their work. I'm going to have to check them. And yes, if you come to me and you charge me like 
a thousand, two thousand, five thousand dollars, I might not be in a position where I can justify making that investment. But just because I can't justify making that investment doesn't mean that other people can't either. And so when you price your services high, your value is high. And if you're not getting people to pay you higher prices, then it usually means that they don't believe that the value is there. And so you have to prove that the value is there. And that's where the case studies really come into play because it's like, hey, if you show me this case study that you did for someone, I can now wrap my mind more around trusting you and provide like that you will actually get me the intended result. And so one other thing that's also really helpful, which has helped me, like even when I was a beginner, it helped me charge high prices was one, splitting into payment plans, giving people like a way to split up like the package. And the second thing is having like a guarantee at like attached to the offer. If you guarantee and give the person some kind of risk reversal that will increase the amount of people that jump on your offer because it says hey this person is someone who's willing to hold themselves accountable it kind of de-risks the proposition for the person paying you because they're like hey if i pay you and this goes really really bad i have a way to kind of bail out and that's very appealing for a lot of people especially if they're working with you as like a beginner. And so as you get better, you don't need to have guarantees because people just, you just have a, such a big track record. But when you're starting out, it's very helpful and it helps you charge the prices that in reality you should be charging. I think people who go out there and charge like 200 bucks or like, for, for like a landing page or something like that. I think they're wasting their time. Either they're massively undervaluing what their worth is to the customer, or they're giving the customer like a useless product, in which case the customer now has to redo everything. They've just wasted $200. So like, that's kind of like my take on it. Yeah, no, I think that was great. And I think you wrap both of those in together because I do think they are, they, they do correlate. And I think you you hit on those points perfectly. And I agree with exactly what you're saying. I want to get a little more context on, on what you actually do. Let's talk about the brand strategist, Twitter brand strategist. Let's get a little deeper into some of that stuff. So essentially what I do is I help people build brands. I know that's like a super like cop out <laughs> answer, but it's like I right now I've been kind of expanding like the range of services that I offer. So I help people go on like LinkedIn, Instagram, like build out email automations, like all of that stuff, build out landing pages, like the whole nine. But the main thing that a lot of people come to me for is Twitter. And so like, hey, I don't understand Twitter. I don't understand how to grow on Twitter or I just don't have the time to grow on Twitter. I'm a busy CEO. I'm busy doing other high leverage activities in my business. And this is something that I can afford to farm out. And so that's where I kind of step in and I say, hey, based on kind of your budget, I can either coach you or I can work with you like full time, essentially doing the stuff for you. And that's really kind of the scope of what I do. And so I will essentially for my main program that I offer people, the main package is I take people from absolute zero to like 10K followers within usually three months. Although lately with the algorithm changes, things are a lot more unpredictable. So what I say is I'll take you to 10K followers in three months if I don't because the algorithm is being kind of weird. I'll work with you forever until I get you there. And then that way there's like that. I whole love thing. that. Hey, like you're not at risk. I'm not like in this like time crunch where I'm like, I have to do this in order to like make sure that I get you there. Like I'm giving you kind of like a way where we all kind of win. But the algorithm has been very unpredictable lately. So drilling down that exact figure in exactly three months, it's a tricky proposition. And so I really help people do that. And I help th them turn their accounts into essentially lead generating machines. And so like for me personally, I'm like, I'm getting like dozens of inbound leads like every week and like a healthy number of like leads like per month. And I actually have to DQ a lot of them because it's just like, I just, can only work with the people with the highest potential. And so I kind of give my clients the guidance to set that up for themselves and or set that up for them, depending on the scope of the work that I'm doing. But all of that's kind of encompassed in what I do. Usually if they want to expand other platforms, I help them do that. Or if they're like, hey, I want to develop a newsletter, build out email automations, build out landing pages, build out courses, communities, like the whole nine essentially help them out with like everything end to end. 
but I usually lead with that Twitter offer because when people see the Twitter following, they're they just like, like, oh my God, this guy can definitely help me with that. So it's kind of, you lead with like the thing you are most credible in, and then you use the success of that service to upsell them into like other things. This is also a thing I would recommend a lot of people is like, lead with something you are very, very strong at. And when you over deliver for your client on what you lead with, then they trust you so much more to optimize their business in a cachet of other ways. And that's how you grow massive businesses by dialing in customer retention, by building out systems and by just having a track record for massive customer success. Yeah, I mean, I think this is all great. And one congratulations on being able to to scale this up to what it's at now. For anybody listening that might be like, shit, this is perfect for me, or this is something I want to get into. I know you're approachable on Twitter. That's how we got connected. But what does it look like from the customer's perspective? What type of budget should I have? What should I expect? Do I have to buy all of the services? Or is it kind of like I can go a la carte? I need this, I need that. Um, maybe break that down a little bit for anybody that's listening and might want to become a potential customer. Yeah, so it's the Leela card. I'm not going to make someone buy like all of my services to work with me. That would be a lot of money. Like that's like, <laughs> just unreasonable for a lot of people. So I typically have like the, like a done with you kind of like one-on-one -on -one coaching slash like group coaching. And then I have a, like a done for you where I basically, I just take over your account and like do everything for you. And so the done for you is definitely a higher price range just because, and it really depends on the scope of the work that most customers want me to do for them. But what I'll do is I'll talk to a customer and I'll assess in my mind the difficulty of doing what they are asking me to do. And then I'll assign a price to that. So that ranges anywhere from usually around like 10 to like 25K. Now, a lot, if a lot of people can't afford that, I also offer like done with you, like one-on-one -on -one coaching. And I typically charge around right now it's at 2K, but as more people sign up for that and like my time becomes more and more and more valuable, that number is probably going to go up just because I can only take on so many people. I can't like it's one on one. I, I, I like I can't like do yeah. that with like a million people. And so that's kind of where I'm at now. For a lot of people starting out, they don't have to go that high. Like I know like high ticket pricing is like something that is important. But if you're charging someone like 2k for like coaching, and you have like 20 followers, like yeah, they're just not going to buy from you. And yeah. So I think a reasonable rate to charge people is like, if you're starting out in like the done for you, like brand building kind of space, I would charge maybe like 3k per month, like that's like a healthy place to start maybe even like 2k a month, like maybe even like that price could be like a great place to start. Like I've definitely taken on clients for that size before even something like if you do like 200 bucks for like a few coaching sessions like i know that's lower ticket but it's like you're literally just hopping on a call with someone and talking and until you actually have a track record and strong success you really have no business like coaching and like giving people like advice so you can only really help the people like behind you and so when you're starting out like your value is just going to be a lot lower but as you get more experienced and you dial in and hey, even if you work for free for a few customers, get some case studies. Well, guess what that does to your rates? You can go, you can take them way up. And so up, way up. Yeah, that's the kind of thing where like it really depends on like where someone is at. But if they're at if they're starting out, those are pretty fair prices, I would think. Yeah, I think that's great. And I think you you touched on a follow up question for me, which you, which is great. I was gonna ask if you wanted to build this out, what does it look like? But you just went through and answered all of that. So thank you. And then for anybody listening who might want to become a customer, now you know what to look for. Very approachable. So even if you don't know if you're in that budget, I, I suggest you reach out and at least find out because I could see how this could be really helpful to people. And it's something you've, you piqued my interest from this perspective because I'm working on growing my personal brand and using that to help grow this podcast. So I absolutely love everything you went and I hope people were taking some notes because I think this is going to be really beneficial to people listening, especially to our crowd on Twitter who loves to tune in and and loves to continue to learn on how to grow themselves. A way for us kind of to step away from the business business conversation here as we come to the end, happens every episode, very simple question. What are you excited about in the near future? Excited about two things, man. First thing is I'm excited to work with a lot more incredible people, scale this business up and really just try to figure out ways where I can just really dial in like how well I can serve customers and absolutely how much money I can just make people because I really like my goal at the end of the day is I just want to make people as much money as I humanly can. And so that's one thing I'm just I'm constantly studying this stuff and I'm super excited to try to figure out how to dial that in. But the thing is I'm having dinner with my family 
uh, tonight. So I'm super excited about that. I think we're trying like a sushi restaurant. So really excited for that. And love that. Love to dive in. Yeah, no, I, I love that answer. Some people just can't disconnect from business. So I absolutely love that you're able to follow that up with something personal, which I think is great. It's always important to enjoy the little things like that. How can people follow you? I want to help the lazy people in the world who are not going to click the description. So maybe read out what your at name is on Twitter so that they know where to go connect with you. Yeah, so my at name on Twitter is just at Rohith Kalior. The last name is spelled K-A-L-I-Y-U-R. It's just my name. And yeah, it's pretty easy. I'm pretty approachable. If people want to like shoot me DMs, hop on calls and just like talk, like I'm pretty open to that. Now, if you send me like three paragraphs on like some, like, <laughs> like, some kind of like tangent that, if you're just normal, like, and you're not like weird, like I'm happy to hop on calls with people. I'm not like a huge, like you have to have like 50,000 followers to talk with me. I'm not that kind of guy. Like I'll hop on calls with a lot of people and yeah, you can find me on Twitter. Awesome, man. I love that. All of Rohit's stuff is going to be linked in the description below. Thank you so much for coming on the show. It has been an absolute pleasure and I'm really excited for this episode to come out and more people to hear the story. And anybody that's made it this far, again, like, subscribe, comment, do all that good stuff. And also make sure to go check out Rahat's stuff. And like we've been saying, connect with him. If you're a business owner and you think this is perfect, go inquire about it. There's a ton of value in creating communities and creating your brands on social media. It is a huge untapped market, especially for brands who have been around for a while and haven't really hopped on this new curb. So I suggest you guys go reach out. Rohef, again, thank you so much for coming on the show. And I'm super excited for this relationship to continue. Of course, man. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me again. And <laughs> like, it's always fun to talk about stories, get to know people. And dude, I'm looking forward forward to this episode coming out sure you're gonna crush it with your podcast man and excited to see where this takes you as well my guy yeah for sure thank you so much i know that this is just the beginning of a great relationship and i can't wait to win together boom let's do it